Welcome everybody to our external webinar. At today's presentation, we are going to have Dr. Marianne Martone and Dr. Anita Brandowski. Dr. Martone is the principal investigator of the Neuroinformatics Framework Project. She just completed her tenure as the U.S. Scientific Representative to the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, where she still heads the program on ontologies, and she is the president of Force 11. This is an organization dedicated to advancing Sholali communication and e-Sholarship. Dr. Brandowski's background is bench neuroscience, and electrophysiology. She started working in bioinformatics with the Human Genome Project at Celera as a scientific curator, and currently she works at UCSD on the Neuroscience Information Framework. In today's presentation, they are talking about resource identification initiatives. Please welcome Dr. Martone and Dr. Brandowski. Hello, everyone. Hello, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we're going to do a little bit of a tag team. Uh, Anita has uh, really been the force behind this initiative, so she's going to give the main presentation, but I will pop in as necessary. Anita. Okay, thank you very much. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bit of a background on the resource identification initiative. There are a lot of little icons there that you'll see. Um, some of those icons are government. Some of those icons are for-profit companies. There is obviously the INCF. It's a nonprofit entity. And, of course, Force 11, um, which uh, essentially was one of the reasons behind it. And, and what Marianne um, is going to talk about a little bit today is some of the Force 11 activities that she's president. But the, it is important to recognize that there are a lot of different players and partners here. And um, the, the beauty of this initiative has been a, an ability to bring together a lot of different stakeholders around a single table, around a single goal. And that goal, of course, is uh, resource identification. So um, the, the problem and the question is incredibly simple, seemingly simple. And it's looking at a sentence like this. This is coming out of a, a method section that, you know, things you've heard before, you've seen before. And the following antibodies were used for immunoblotting, actin, MAB, 1 in 10,000 dilution from Sigma Aldrich. So then every good scientist would go to the Sigma Aldrich catalog to find this monoclonal antibody, and there are 40. Which one? Which one did they choose? Which one did they actually use? Should I buy all 40 and redo these experiments? So that would be both time inefficient and rather expensive. The papers right now identify antibodies and other key reagents at a very in, uh, not a great level, right? And this should be the simplest part of the whole process. There is no reason not to identify this in a better way. So what the research um, these research resources are actually not uniquely identifiable. So our colleagues at the OHSU um, published a paper in 2013 in PureJ, um, which basically took antibodies, cell lines, constructs, uh, knockdown reagents, and even organisms, and said, and asked a simple question, how many of these things coming out of the methods section could we reasonably identify? So if you look at the antibodies here, and, and Believe me, the criteria here are not very strong. If you look at this, it means less than 50% of the antibodies that are found in the literature were identifiable by a very weak criterion, which means I found one thing in the catalog. This is not to say that there's anything going on in terms of um, you know, how, whether there was even a catalog number. They, they didn't even look that far. They just said, was there only one reagent in the catalog? So only 50% of the antibodies that were cited in the literature were um, actually uh, identified. Cell line, it's about that construct even worse. Knockdown reagents tended to be pretty good, and organisms actually were also fairly good, but not great. We could certainly do better. So um, we don't provide enough information, and this is something that's very, very straightforward. We should be able to do this. 
Now, who cares, right? Well, it turns out that if you can't identify, just track the ability to use a particular reagent or product, actually people are starting to care. There's a whole special issue in nature. There are lots of discussions about this. There have been um, various things specifically about antibodies, um, Harkenheim et al., um, and there are all of these, uh, these press releases and other things going on that really describe the, the problem and the issue around specifically antibodies, but a lot of other religions and, and resources as well. Um, so what do we do about this? Well, Resource Identification Initiative is a community-led effort to introduce much better reporting standards for research resources. Ideally, these were machine processable, uniform across publishers. So machine processable would be, I go and ask for all reagents um, that were used of a particular type. Would that be cool to be able to ask? Yes, it would. Can't be done today. Uniform across publishers. I can't stress enough. I, I mean, I'm not sure if we need a show of hands of how many people have gone in and submitted a paper and formatted all their references with the periods and the commas and the whatevers, and then have to resubmit to a different journal or made, you know, made a different choice to submit to a different journal, and then all of those things had to be redone. I think it's a waste of time. It is truly um, time that could be spent um, in, in better science. So with the Resource Identification Initiative, we aimed to have a single standard across all publishers. We, we want it to be outside of the paywall so that you can ask any system and um, get the same answer. It relies on a lot of community repositories. So these accession numbers um, are very, very important, and the community repositories are already out there. So here's some more of the, the press that's out um, in terms of uh, th this is actually covering the nature piece, covering um, the initiative. We need one standard. This uniform across publishers is very important to people. You shouldn't have to rewrite your methods each time you might want to submit a journal to a different paper or a, a paper to, to a different journal. I would right. like to ask the participants to move their phones. It's very noisy. Is this possible? Okay, um, so Marianne, you were going to discuss Force 11. Right, so this initiative, the Resource Identification Initiative, is being run as a working group out of Force 11. And since I thought many people here would not be familiar with Force 11, um, hold on, I'll use the headset because there's a lot of noise around here. Um, I thought it would be useful to just go over the nature of the organization and what its goals are and why this initiative has run out of it. So FORCE 11 stands for the Future of Research Communications and e-scholarship. And it really characterizes itself as a grassroots effort, um, not that this is, uh, you know, um, community activism because there's a lot of uh, high-level people who have been instrumental in getting Force 11 started, but it was recognized that sometimes, you know, you need a community platform to sort of focus and bring together uh, efforts around a particular topic. And in this case, uh, the specific goal of Force 11 is to accelerate the pace and nature of scholarly communications and e-scholarship specifically through technology. So it was founded recognizing that in the age of the Internet, in the age of the web, a lot of our scholarly practices don't really uh, work. Um, why is it 11? We were born in 2011 from a workshop, and you can read the principles in the Force 11 Manifesto. Um, but I think a bigger question for this particular initiative is who is Force 11? So Force 11 is one of the few, I think, organizations that brings together all of the stakeholders across multiple domains in advancing scholarly communication. Uh, this includes publishers, tool builders, funders, policymakers, library and information sciences, and it also includes the sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. 
So it was really the ideal uh, set of um, circumstances in which to be able to launch this initiative because what we were really looking at, as uh, Anita says, is a way to take advantage of search systems and other things to create a system of citation that does not involve Thomson Reuters, it doesn't involve having to go from behind a, a paywall, it doesn't involve us having to resolve 6,000 different uh, styles of resolving individual citations. Those things all came about because, again, we published primarily in paper and every community was able to create their own uh, systems. But as we've gone through this, we find that there's a lot of things that we do that make it, for example, extremely difficult to use a search engine like Google, as we'll show, to find something very simple without invoking a lot of natural language processing and what have you. So that's why it was run out of Force 11. And uh, through Force 11 and also the efforts of our program officers and others at NIF who tried to ask very simple questions, again, like who we funded this big project that makes knockout mice, we funded this huge project that makes software tools, who's actually using these? Who, who in the literature has actually published with these? It turned out it was just way too difficult to ask this question. So we started a series of meetings that largely arose out of neuroscience, but very quickly expanded way beyond neuroscience, uh, in order to bring all of those stakeholder groups together. Because even though everybody started to recognize the problem, uh, they all have a different take on how one needs to uh, solve it. They also are all operating under different constraints that unless you bring them all to the table, you don't always appreciate. So we uh, had a series of planning meetings where we brought the publishers, we brought the editors, we brought some of the researchers, we brought the repositories and said, this is what we want to do. How can we go about doing it in a way that will work within your context? So the pilot project was initially identified and it was very important that we narrowed the scope down to things that we could actually uh, achieve. That is, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, when we asked authors to do this, that they would be able to complete the task. So we focused on three different types of uh, research resources. One are model organisms. So these include genetically modified mice, flies, worms, what have you. Uh, there's a lot of standards around these organisms, but for example, the nomenclature that was developed to identify uh, a mouse uh, is very difficult to parse with a machine because it involves special characters like deltas, superscripts, subscripts, slashes, all the things that work fine for a human who understands what they're looking at, but because of the nature of information systems can pose a challenge. Antibodies were chosen because, again, those are a huge source of variabilities, and researchers, uh, when they were asked to do this, all said, oh, that's great. You know, I wish we'd had something like this a long time ago. But we also chose software and databases because, again, the original motivation of this was uh, coming from uh, NIH program officers who said, we don't really have a good way of tracking these in literature. We don't know how many people are using these things, and neither do many of the people who are even creating these because there's been no system or standard for citing them. Um, also, one of the key things about these, as Anita indicated, was that they each had a repository that was fairly comprehensive. Um, in the case of the model organisms, they tended to be somewhat scattered. That is, they're not all in one place. You have flies, you have mice, you have uh, frogs. But they at least had the model organism databases whose job it was to sort of track these unique entities. For antibodies, we had the antibody registry that was created by the NIF project, and that had about 2.5 million antibodies, uh, which was a good uh, swath of the research antibodies in use. And for software and databases, the NIF project had also been charged with uh, cataloging all of the the databases and tools that had come out of NIH funding, so we had about 13,000 of these uh, already in our database. The authors were going to be asked to put the RRID in the method section of the paper. We did not want this to be used for every mention of these things in a paper. That is, we wanted the RRID to be um, included where it was actually used to produce the findings of a study. Uh, it was going to be voluntary for authors because the big journals like uh, Nature and Science and, and Neuron and Cell can, uh, can exert a lot of um, 
control over their authors. That is, they can put in as many barriers as they want, and the authors are still going to participate. But a lot of the smaller journals and specialty journals were very concerned that if they added another thing uh, in there, would the authors uh, balk? They also were very concerned, reasonably so, that um, in the pilot project, if we set something up and it turns out the authors were confused, they weren't able to do it, and it was a barrier, it might scare people away. So we made sure that it was uh, voluntary for authors, that is, they weren't um, going to be required to do it. Journals also did not have to modify their submission system. And this was very important to them. Uh, as you learn in the scholarly landscape, there's a few big players that control journal submission systems. Modifying software is always a big deal. And so they wanted to have some statistics before they took extra steps to actually incorporate this into the journal submission system. And we respected this. We respected uh, all of these uh, concerns. We also realized that if they did not have to modify their submission system, the level of permission to get a publisher or journal to participate was very low. If you wanted to do anything more substantive than you were looking at a year or so in order to get permission. So we did not want that to happen. So we, with these constraints in mind, we designed uh, a, a system along with our colleagues at OHSU and other places. The pilot project officially launched in 2014. Initially there was a three-month commitment and we had about 25 journals on board. Um, but as you can see, we're well beyond the three-month period of February 2014. And that is because the pilot project has gone so successfully that we've had more and more journals uh, actually come on board. So one of the things that was necessary in order to have this work is you needed some sort of infrastructure. Because we dealt with three different types of research resources, that actually covers about 15 different authoritative databases. And so while many people had had the idea before and had approached journals to actually include these accession numbers for one type of research resource, you realize that if you had uh, published a paper that used a software tool, uh, um, a genetically modified mouse, or a, and an antibody, which is perfectly reasonable in some domains, you might have to go to three or four or five different databases to get those IDs. That's simply not going to work. So even though the RRID project is predicated on a distributed infrastructure that actually takes advantage of investments that NIH and other funding agencies already made in establishing these registries, without some sort of centralized infrastructure to be able to serve these, to put it in practice uh, across the board in biomedicine, in fact, would be very difficult. So we used the infrastructure that had been created through NIF and its uh, off-spin uh, SciCrunch, uh, which is sort of a generic version of NIF, in order to be able to provide the aggregation services so that people could come to one place to find their antibodies, tools, and um, uh, tools and model organisms, get the appropriate information through a Cite This button, and put this into their papers. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of metadata that is included, but the essential thing of an RRID is basically the prefix RRID colon appended, uh, prepended to any of the accession numbers that come from these databases. One of the rules in using identifiers is not to reassign identifiers, and so we use the native identifiers that are there. Uh, as one can discuss later, that does produce some challenges in that it's impossible to create a uniform expression for all of these RIDs. But actually, if you look at the syntax, it's pretty easy to pull out uh, using search algorithms. We also established a help desk, and that was also important for the journals to participate because even though uh, they were behind it, they said we don't necessarily have the staff, we don't have the expertise to adjudicate antibodies and other sorts of things. And so we said that's fine. We're going to create a help desk that allows people to ask questions if they have problems, and we've promised that we would respond to them. And we have done so, but the good news is, as you'll see in the statistics, we haven't had to answer an inordinate number of these questions. People generally have been able to do the task. And as I turn this back over to Anita to go through the results of the pilot project, I think you'll see that authors, in fact, were able to complete the task fairly well. So let me now turn this back over to Anita so she can show you some of the outcomes of this project. Thank you, Marianne. I think that was great. Um, okay, so now what we can do, um, this, this doesn't work perfectly inside of PubMed and PubMed Central, but it sure works really well on Google Scholar. Um, so what we were able to do is we were able to 
now go in and, and you are encouraged to try this at home. Um, go in and try to type in RRID colon and then your favorite resource ID. So for example, here we have an antibody, um, 90755. This is one of the millipore antibodies. And um, what we can do is we can now ask the question um, and simply um, ask Google Scholar to bring back all the papers that had this antibody cited via this ID. And if we look um, a little more um, in a little bit more detail about this, we see that actually that particular ID results to a couple of different um, citation methods. So one of the questions was, um, were authors going to be able to do this? Well, they're not citing the Merck antibody that this now is. Um, they're citing the um, antibody that they find in their, uh, labeled with whatever their bottle had. And um, Chemicon is the company that originated this. Many people bought that particular antibody from Chemicon. Now Chemicon's been um, out of business for eight years. Millipore actually took over um, the antibody line and became Millipore for many years. Um, then it became E and B Millipore. Um, Millipore Select Chemical, by the way, that was never a company. Um, the E and B Millipore has not yet been cited in this list, but um, I imagine that that will be cited at some point because there are some bottles out there with the same product in it that are called E and B Millipore. And now, of course, this is Merck. So the same identifier, though, is present in all of these. So while the authors are not able to perfectly cite every portion of this, they certainly um, have uh, a kind of a hybrid approach. Um, even though we ask them for a very specific citation, they have a bit of a hybrid approach with what they're used to, like citing the, the name of the city where the um, company was once based, um, versus the, um, the current, which is just having the, um, the catalog number and the, the uh, company name as well as the ID. But the good news is the identifier is in there. And with that identifier, we can pull out a whole lot of other things because that just tags the papers that actually use that specific product. And we keep track of this. So um, uh, we actually look, we have a live spreadsheet um, that updates. And I'll show you some of the um, kind of latest and greatest results. Um, but there are well over 500 um, papers that have now used um, some kind of an RRID in them. These appear in over 70 journals. Uh, new ones uh, appear all the time. Um, hundreds of thousands of antibodies came in from vendors to the antibody registry um, after their authors were asking the uh, antibody vendors about them. Um, many hundreds have been added by individuals, and lots and lots of software tools and databases were added to one of the other registries. Unfortunately, we don't have data on how many mice or rats or what have you have been added, um, as we don't personally track that. Um, those requests get sent back out to MGI or they get sent out to uh, RGD or Lucent, um, where the authors go through, you know, those model organism community, um, uh, communities in order to assign the proper nomenclature. So here are some of the journals where we found these RRIDs. Uh, the Journal of Comparative Neurology is by far the, the largest journal that um, assigns these. Um, and we have uh, a lower amount of compliance with some of these other journals. Um, Neuron and Cell Press have come online very recently, so there are many fewer um, there are many fewer uh, papers there, but we expect those to rise. Um, same with the Journal of uh, Neuroscience Research. This is another one that um, now is is asking this as a as a, um, um, as a, a part of the publication process and is asking um, authors. To, to do this uh, very routinely so people are kind of getting on board. Um, faculty of a thousand also running this, but a lot of this reflects, you know, how many actual papers come out from a particular journal, whereas um, some journals are quite large. Um, Loss one never came on board, but actually there are lots of papers. One of these bigger blips is, uh, is actually plus one, um, just kind of reflecting the uneven landscape of the journal. Okay. Um, so we, we also were very interested to figure out how accurate authors are. And um, if you look at the antibodies, when we uh, looked just at the first 100 papers that came out, um, we did a very deep analysis. 
trying to figure out if you're looking at antibodies, organisms, software, um, or databases, what the counts were. If we look at the error rates, um, they were very, very low for software tools and databases. Um, and they were fairly low for antibodies. A lot of these are, are simply, you know, like somebody left off a, a last trailing zero out of a number or what have you. Um, so most of the time, people are very, very accurate about this. Um, there were a couple of um, issues that we had with the organisms um, uh, reflected in this higher rate, but I think a lot of those have now been resolved. Um, essentially, uh, you know, we, we've gone a long way, and, and MGI came um, came to our rescue and said, "Okay, this is how we're going to help the authors um, identify these um, these uh, genotypes better." So they've they've gone a long ways to being able to address some of this, but essentially. There's about, um, if you look at the overall numbers, <coughs> there is about less than a 4% error rate in all of these resources, which I think is great news. People are able to do it, they're willing to do it, and they're doing it. And I think that this is the, um, the final analysis. So if we look at these antibodies, the percent identifiability goes way, way up for all of the different um, types of resources that are out there. And this is looking, um, again, at the exact journals right before the, the pilot versus right after the pilot. And this is just looking at the first 100 papers. So, um, you know, we've had uh, additional, um, uh, additional papers um, published and they, they continue to come out um, on a weekly basis. Okay. Now, if you have something that is kind of semi-machine processable, like just an ID. It doesn't have any fancy code behind it. It's just the author basically typing in RRID colon AB underscore whatever that number is. If you have that, what can you do with it? And the cool thing is that our friends over at Science Direct have created a resolver service. So whenever they detect that RRID colon, they're able to. The I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, SciCrunch has the resolver service. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. SciCrunch has the resolver, but um, they, uh, the, whenever the um, Science Direct folks detect that RRID string inside of one of their papers, then what happens is that the resolver service is invoked and the data from, um, from the SciCrunch resolver actually comes up here on the side of the article. And this they've made available outside of the paywall as well, um, aligning themselves very, very nicely with um, the idea that a lot of this information, this metadata around the paper, will be available outside of the paywall. So it's all available to everyone. Um, and the resolver is, of course, uh, available to uh, lots of third-party tools, not just, um, not just Science Direct. Um, we have that. It's an open, uh, open product. So you should be able to find that um, information if you want to build a tool. And there certainly are others that are um, willing to try and, and use that data. And uh, one of them is Hypothesis, and I believe that Marianne will talk about that sometime later. We're not quite ready. But there are certainly very cool things that one can do with this kind of information. Um, uh, Anita, there is a question from Melissa Harrison. It says, the interface is behind a barrier URL on the slide. Why? So the PsyCrunch resolver shouldn't be behind a barrier. No, the PsyCrunch resolver is not. Um, I, I'm not sure what she means. No, oh, you have to go PsyCrunch.org resources with an S. <laughs> yeah, resources and then slash and then you need to put an ID. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, um, so moving, uh, moving along, and, and I can dom demonstrate that um, in a bit if you like. But um, so, what have we learned, right? So, if you bring people together in the spirit of partnership to solve a problem, um, you define a participation model that respects the constraints under which the stakeholder is operating, and keep it simple, you can actually succeed. And I think that's the main thing that we have learned. We've learned that if you keep this relatively simple, if you get the willingness of the community to participate, then you can actually succeed in one of these projects. 
Um, there have been many of these in the past, um, but I think in general, this has been an incredibly successful one. So, what's next? Believe it or not, our IDs are here to stay. Uh, we keep getting more and more journals. This isn't going to go away anytime soon. There are governance issues. What other entities do we want to go after? Anything that has a source of variability, um, but you also need some kind of an authoritative and comprehensive registry. We have a few of those. We don't have all of them. There's lots of places in the community where these registries exist. We need to draw on those community resources um, that we should be able to, um, that we can use and, and incorporate into the RIDs. RIDs are not here to replace those things. RIDs are here to complement them and make sure that these things are actually used in the literature. Technical issues. Questions like how machine actionable do these things need to be? And I think we're seeing that they don't need to be all that machine actionable. As long as the identifier string is unique or relatively unique, we can do really well and then we can uh, do a little bit of cleanup on the back end and we are a much better place than we were when we started. There are certainly authoring tools. There are validation services that need to be built. Some of those are in, in the works. Um, but essentially, what you need is that number. And one of the things that we wanted to put in a plug here um, to uh, the Resource Identification Technical Specifications Working Group, um, that's kind of a mouthful, but I think a few of the folks from that particular group are now here on the, on the call. Um, and what, it, what we wanted to do is say, hey, come get involved. This is, this is a great initiative. Um, some of the next steps are actually putting this into um, the ISO standards and, and other things so that it is easier and easier to bring in journals and bring in publishers in a more robust way. So in terms of what we want, right? I don't really need to see a show of hands, but it would be great. How many people are working on a paper right now? Because if you're working on a paper, guess what? You can do this. It's really easy. If you go to sitecrunch.org slash resources, not resource, but resources. Sorry, Melissa, I now understand what happened. Um, what you can do is you can actually go in there and you can find whatever it is, antibody, organism, or um, uh, or software tool that you're actually working with and just put it in your paper. It's as easy as putting in um, copying and pasting. And copying and pasting is possible to do by almost all authors. It's awesome. All right. Many of you also review papers, right? And if you actually, so if reviewers are like gods, right? They're revered as gods. And one of the things that you can ask for, which is really, really simple, is, hey, identify your resources. You say you're using an antibody. Which one are you using? I can't find that one. Ask for the ID. It's actually a really simple thing to do. And then um, one of the things that we've, we've been able to do by um, speaking in these kind of um, venues um, is to actually ask uh, editors, editors-in-chief especially, of various journals. As you've heard from Marianne, this is a very simple thing to do. Um, we've got instructions to authors, which by the way, nobody reads, um, in many, many journals. Um, but really, it's, it's about letting your staff know that you care about this, putting it in checklists. We have all those kind of materials um, available on the Force 11 website um, for research identification initiatives. We have the group that will help you um, essentially add a specific checklist if you want to do that, or checklist items if you want to do that for your particular journey. And essentially, this is a relatively easy and straightforward thing to do. So again, these are the things that we would love to get your participation on. And um, especially if you can you know, do it in your papers, it's actually not that hard. Um, <laughs> it's just a number, and it goes into the methods section, and um, it can sort of go, um, go, uh, and you can forget about it. 
the next journal will take it if your, your first journal doesn't. So um, we would like to give lots of thanks to lots of people who have worked on the um, Force 11 group, the Research Identification Group, including Matt, Jeff, um, Melissa, David, Sean, um, Patrick, and, and lots and lots of other people. These are all the authors of the paper as well, which came out today, version two. Um, it is going out um, to four different journals, the, the four of the main participating journals in this um, initiative that came out just this morning. I got notes. And um, what I would love to say is, oops, Stephanie Hamstrom is telling us that our email is incorrect for complaints. Okay, let's see. What do we do here? Reynolds at Force 11. Okay, um, yeah, it's info at force11.org. Sorry, guys. Um, Marianne, I didn't catch that. No, I saw that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, and, and um, so now we have Ron, and we have lots of other people asking questions. So we wanted to open this up to everybody, and um, I'm sorry, I went through uh, and muted everybody um, after I stopped talking. Um, so I'm going to go through and kind of unmute people. I'd love to get your comments, questions, criticisms, you know. Um, obviously, now we know the rental thing is wrong, so we're sorry about that. Um, Stephanie, thank you. But guys, um, please uh, tell us. Okay, let's see. Uh, so we have, we have okay, two one. questions, um, one about, of course, other identifier systems and DOIs, which that, comes uh, up all the yeah. time. And then the second one is about software citations. Yeah, I was on this web conference thing. Well, they, they want me to yeah, I think may, people still may need to mute if they're having other conversations. Um, so uh, we have a question about when you cite something on GitHub, for example, are you citing the main page and not necessarily a version number? So both of these are excellent questions. Um, Anita, did you want to take those, or you want me to? Well, I think we had a very nice discussion <laughs> prior with Dan Cat. Prior exactly to <laughs> about both of these issues. He, he already sent in his question and said, "DOI specifically right. pointing to an archived version of a software tool would be really a much better way to." Um, to add citations, and we, we've discussed this a lot with a lot of different people. Um, so I think that there are certain functions which are absolutely uh, necessary. I think one of them is an aggregation function. So if you have, um, and we can look back at this, the power of being able to simply ask Google Scholar or any of the other um, uh, data providers uh, for, for scholarly data. Uh, scholarly uh, <clears throat> a very simple query like this. This doesn't take um, a huge or statement that says, oh, this DOI or that DOI or that DOI or that DOI. Um, it, it simply asks for a single number. Now, on the other hand, it is very easy if you have this particular ID being cited and you want to cite a version. Um, that you would ask a ver you would cite a version with that particular DOI. Um, we've been in, in talks and, and we've been doing a lot of thinking about this. And certainly, there needs to be a place which says, "Okay, here's an antibody, and there are a bunch of lot numbers." Yes, there are. We don't have that information right now, but if we start to aggregate it inside of papers, maybe this particular antibody is lot number I don't know one. This one might be lot number five. This one might be lot number seven. It's the same product, but these are different lots. In the same way as a particular software tool like FreeSurfer, maybe the same FreeSurfer, that has one identifier, but it might very well be a very different FreeSurfer if you're using version one versus version five. So it's a very analogous situation. and. I think that where we need to come together with this part of the community <coughs> is we need to do a little bit better in asking the author, hey, if you have a version or if you have a, um, a uh, lot number, let's just add that in. If you have it, add it. It's cool. There is nothing wrong with that. But having that aggregating identifier makes it really easy for anybody to find all the tools that actually, uh, all the papers, excuse me, that cited a particular tool or a particular antibody. <coughs> and I think um, that's where we can we can uh, go with a lot of this 
uh, kind of question. Yeah. So, so I, I also have a few comments on this because this, this issue comes up all the time. And in fact, I was just at the ORCID outreach meeting, you know, the unique researcher ID. And one of the things that I always make the case for um, with antibodies and model organisms in particular um, is they're not digital entities, right? So they're, and, and neither am I. And that's why I don't get a DOI. I get an ORCID. Um, and you know, the idea that you would want to aggregate information together about a specific instance, in this case myself, or a class of antibodies or a class of organisms, I think is quite, um, is quite real. And nobody owns that. It does not resolve to a single place. It is just a digital, as somebody put it, middle initial that makes it easy to pull information about assertions that it has something to do with this thing. Software and databases kind of fall in between. Because when we started a NIF actually cataloging these things, so NIF's original uh, mandate was to say, hey, NIH has funded all of these things. Go find them. Go see what they funded. Go see who's using them. Turns out, again, that it was virtually impossible to sort of ask that question. But when you go and you look at some of these things, and I think this gets to, the, you know, to, to Mary's question, some of them resolve to, here's a bit of code that's on the Internet that I used. Some of them resolve to an organization that is, in fact, or a project that is bigger than any one specific version. Uh, at the ORCID meeting, it was, I thought, very um, you know, nice to see that Patricia Cruz, who recently, I think, left uh, CDL, and I can't remember where she went to, maybe data site, um, was saying, you know what, we don't have any good way of identifying projects or organizations. Um, that's been a major you know, issue in trying to be able to do these types of broad queries of who's using what. And she's like, we need a way of being able to identify projects. And I said, well, actually, that's exactly what we've been doing. Um, that we are quite clear in the paper and we're quite clear every place else that we're not going down to the individual um, version number. We would not even have the capacity to identify just a snippet of code that somebody stuck in um, GitHub unless we specifically aggregated it. But you can actually see that there's a range in which people refer to these things. And so I don't think it's a matter of either or. I think it's a matter of either when. When, would, when does an RID make sense and when does a DOI make sense? And how those two things can work together uh, rather than saying one is better than the other. The other thing that was really important to me um, was that, in fact, this be put into the text itself, not into a reference list where it is often disconnected from the text. Because uh, you might just have a number one, and the thing that it actually points to is down in the reference list. But it was important to me that the antibody identifier and the snippet of text which it identified actually appeared together with one another. And I think one recognizes that in terms of readability, human readability, encountering a long URL or encountering a DOI when you're actually reading kind of makes your brain go fizzle a bit, right? It's not something that human beings like to look at. It's not <laughs> something that they easily resolve. But accession numbers, which have a long history in, uh, in, in at least the biosciences, right, gene accession numbers, those sorts of things, don't cause that same c kind of um, uh, consternation, right? You can read them and you can say, oh, okay, this is the antibody they're talking about. Oh, and I can also pop that into uh, Google and I can find other things that actually use it. And I think we also have to remember, and this was, again, very important to me because people say, well, what happens if the registries go away? What happens if everything goes away? We know that life is in flux. We know that nothing is permanent. But there is one thing that we have committed as a society uh, to preserving, and that's the scientific literature. So the fact that you had a definition of what the thing was in the side of a piece of text and an RID right next to it, in fact, did help ensure that the definition of that thing was preserved as one went uh, down the line. So I think that you know, RRIDs, they solved a specific problem. And that is not necessarily the complete problem that everybody wishes to solve in terms of reproducibility, machine actionability, and others. But again, it's a lightweight solution. It leverages existing investments of NIH and other funding agencies that have already gone to it. And it kind of provides, and this is what I think is one of the most important things about it, it, is, it went into practice. It went into practice 
actually got people to do it, not our informatics friends, but the actual authors, a naive slice of authors who we have never met, and they understood why they were doing it, they could actually achieve it. And we can actually see how it would work to understand moving forward if this system were to sort of be more broadly adopted, how would one expand it? We did want a community contribution model. We thought that that was very important. And that's why we've said the registries are absolutely critical because anyone can get an identifier. I can go in data site tomorrow and I can get an identifier. I can register it in Zenodo. But what the registries do is more or less what the publishers do, right? They make sure that this article hasn't been published someplace else. So, you know, they do a plagiarism check. They do a uniqueness check. They make sure that the metadata is all standardized. So I view this as part of a larger ecosystem where not every single identifier is going to be able to solve every single problem. And as we sort of alluded to in the question about machine actionability, we're very happy that Julie McMurray and others are leading a technical specifications group, and one can certainly move farther down the line. But a lot of what we do, right, we, we again do design these sorts of things in the absence of global search and things like Google Scholar and what have you. And the question becomes, how much machine actionability do you need? NLP is getting better. Other things are getting better. Can we provide some nuggets that make that task easier? Um, or do we need special XML tags? Do we need you know, a more complex representation? I don't know the answer to it, but I think we've provided a really valuable approach and data set that we know can be implemented now. What that means is, is those 500 articles, which based on the previous statistics, would have had uh, less than half their resources identified, now can be identified. We have an easy handle that can be used to aggregate data. And as I hope to show in a future webinar with things like Hypothesis, which is a web annotation tool, we can then attach information to those RRIDs that we, we, we can broadcast information about these things into different contexts. So, for example, there are many people who probably are shocked that unlike if there's a case of contaminated cumin where we can track back to that lot and say, oh, this is contaminated, we don't have any good way of letting people uh, using the nf kappa b antibodies over here know that Herkenhan over in this other community published a paper that called into question the specificity of that antibody. We don't have a way of broadcasting that information, and I think that that's absolutely necessary. So that's sort of my long answer. Um, but again, I think these things uh, should be able to work together. So Marianne, actually building on top of that, mm -hmm. we do have another question from Ray. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, uh, he says, this is great, but uh, there are multiple efforts to assign PIDs to software underway. And do you think that the publishing process can move with multiple ways to identify software? And I think this is another one of those questions that yes. we have to address. I might also say that I, that wasn't but, it was by the way. So. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Great, by the way. Right. <laughs> but, there, but yes, I think the idea of what it makes sense, you know, what is software, again? Is it an abstract entity? Is it that specific code that um, we're pointing to? I think it's probably both, right? There is something called free surfer. And there's versions of Free Surfer, and you can go to certain places and get Free Surfer. And as long as one can take these use cases and say, if I assign PID X, can I solve all of these use cases? If I can't, then I need something else that's going to make that possible. So I think having the use cases that the RRDs provide is a good starting set. And if you know, if a PID solution is proposed for software. And I say to, uh, you know, I, I ask this question, I'm like, who used any version of Free Surfer anywhere? Because that's if I'm writing my grant what I care about. Um, can it answer that question? If it can't answer that question, then that system's not going to work for that use case, whereas adding an RRID would. So again, I encourage people to think about these things in the context in which they were developed and figure out, A, does one supplant the other, in which case, okay, um, you know, the community can decide which one it wants, um, or do they work in conjunction with each other? And they're really referring to different things. I don't have the answer to that, but I think making sure that these use cases are in the hands of everybody who is developing these things and proposing them is very important. 
And, and by the way, Ray, there's a ton of these, um, these kind of initiatives and efforts going on in the antibody community. So I'm, I'm privy to some of those discussions, which is great. Um, but, you know, there are five, six, seven different efforts trying to figure out, you know, what's a good antibody, what's not a good antibody. The government has um, thrown a bunch of money at some of these institutes in order to say, okay, these antibodies are going to be good, or you're going to go and validate these antibodies. But at the end of the day, what you really need to do is you need to work with the publishers to make sure that those good reagents that have been, you know, that money has been thrown at, especially, um, to, to validate them are, are identifiable. Right? Those are the kinds of things that, hey, I use this one, and this one actually came from an NCI initiative um, to make really good antibodies against this very specific cancer target. And I am finding it, that it's, you know, I'm finding it in my paper, I'm using it, um, and I know that what it's used for. Or, hey, I found some issues with this particular reagent. Maybe there's some drift, maybe there's some other thing. With software, some of the same kind of issues arise, right? We've had some of these big papers talking about things like, um, you know, the, the um, cortical thickness measurements were different, whether you use a Mac or a PC um, in several schools. And so, you know, there are these kinds of issues. And until you document all of the code, including the machine that you're using it on, you're not going to get around all of those issues. Even if you have the specific code, it might run differently on one platform versus another. So I don't think we have this solved. I don't think we do. But what I think we can do is we can get a little bit closer to the right answer. Maybe we can't get there 100% of the way, but this is something that people can do today. And it's something that will help, maybe not completely, but a little bit. Right. So again, to use another thing about DOIs and these identifiers, think of the ORCID, think of the DOI. The article has a DOI, the author has an ORCID, right? So, so that these different systems identify different things at different levels of a granularity, um, we, we see examples of that all the time. So you could very easily see a specific software version resolving to a DOI, GitHub or wherever else it is, but that the project that supported it, the overarching abstract entity that it is, FreeSurfer, resolves to something else. Um, you know, I think one needs to be able to look at it and consider the, the use case, but I think Anita's point is the main one, right, is that because this project grew on its own, okay, so I think that this is something that's very sort of important. If it's a project that solves a problem and that is done in a way that is scalable, you shouldn't have to put in a whole lot of energy to get it to grow, right? People should say, oh, yes, this is a good solution. We're going to adopt it. And so we are very encouraged that considering the modest um, goals of the initial pilot project, that new journals keep coming on board, that it's gained momentum, that on its own there is an RID in the Journal of Poultry Science. We did not get the Journal of Poultry Science on board. It's not what you know we do in neuroscience. But we've also felt that we've given a, 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 an approach that empowers communities to do what, what is in their best interest. We don't know what entities fall into the same category as antibodies, genetically modified animals, and again, software tools and databases for our domain, where the ability to be able to track and aggregate those had, different, had the different use cases, right? Uh, in one case, it was driven by a funder who couldn't figure this information out, in another, and, and the database providers themselves who didn't know who used them. In the other case, with antibodies, it's just because the, the catalogs and things are so fluid that the same antibody morphs into different places. It gets sold under different names. Companies come, companies go. Things are in the catalog. They're not. So, you know, catalog numbers simply aren't persistent identifiers. They're not intended to be. So it solved a different problem for antibodies and genetically modified animals than it did for software. But, you know, the fact that it just by you know, that that people come on board with it does suggest that there's a sweet spot here that we hit and that it in fact can be extended. The model can be extended to other communities where it might turn out that their antibody is a field station, right? That depending if the data comes from field station X, it um it causes a lot of variability. Yeah, you can have that in metadata, but we also know that metadata, you can say the same field station name a hundred different ways. It's why we want these identifiers for these sort of abstract entities. So I think it has a place. 
Um, but I don't think it does what some of these other PID systems are t intended to do, nor should it, right? We, we don't necessarily need to overload it, but I think this is what the technical specifications group is going to be considering, right? How does this fit with other identifier schemes? But I think, again, it's very important to remember the use cases that it was intended to solve may not be the same ones that are being solved in others, and the question is, will one identifier system easily solve them both? Can they work together? Do they need to work together, like ORCIDs and DOIs? Or, again, um, maybe something else is needed. I don't know. But I think that this is a, you know, that this is a data set, and uh, the fact that, again, it is growing on its own indicates that, at least in these domains, we hit something that was uh, necessary. Okay. Um, okay, and so um, I think there is a question that we didn't get to, which was from Melissa, um, uh, Melissa, Melissa, the um, XML tagging recommendations. I think the answer to that is please join the um, Research Identification Initiative uh, Implementation Group, and you guys can absolutely work on that. This, um, there's a, that's the reason why that exists. Um, and when that is decided, when that gets put into all of the ISO standards and everything else, then we'll have something very specific where that will um, actually be uh, the um, uh, part of the publication in a slightly more robust way. Uh, but for now, we do have the ID, and that's a very simple text frame that can actually be, um, be used to find a lot of these. Um, okay. Uh, did we answer everybody's questions? I've, I'm seeing lots of questions, but I think we've got most of them. I think we did. Um, let's see, Mary has a question about software, something on GitHub. For example, if you're citing a main page, it's not necessarily the version number. For a database like UCSC, it's the main site, it's not the assembly version of the genome. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's, there's reason to cite both, right? Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely reason to cite both. When you put in an RID, we're not telling you that you're completely done. You know when you're done. You have a community. You already know what kind of things you should be citing. If you cite the UCSC browser and you're not saying this is version 144, well, you're not citing the latest version, and that's okay. But obviously, you're not complete. You know, this is not complete. But that UCSC browser, what if somebody comes up tomorrow and says, hey, I have a new UCSC browser, in it, and I'm, I'm running it on UCSC.com instead of the um, University of Santa Cruz. And then some new postdoc comes in from some lab, and they're like, oh, I'm supposed to use the UCSC browser. I use this one. Well, that's a different UCSC browser. See, unlike McDonald's, UCSC does not have money to threaten people to, you know, away from using that name. Um, so big companies, McDonald's and whatever, they spend a lot of money saying, hey, we're, we're the only McDonald's in town, right? But different research, um, the UCSC browser and all these other things. And in fact, there are three model DDs. Which one are you talking about? Because right. two of them cover the exact same domain. So you can't tell which one um, is being used unless you use something very much more specific like an ID and um, URLs are good in many cases, imperfect in other cases. So, just makes it easier. I mean, again, it just it makes it easier. And as you see with the um, the driving of people registering, first of all, it gets people to think about things. It gets them to think about what they're saying and what they're doing. Uh, it gets them to um, participate in making sure that the appropriate entities are registry, registered and accounted for. Uh, so I think it just makes it makes certain types of use cases just extremely, uh, not ex completely simple because there's always a little glitches, but. Um, that, you know, I can pull out these RRIDs, that I can pull out a lot of these things. It's unfortunate that it's only in Google Scholar that gets access to the full text, but, um, you know, I pull them out in PubMed Central, I pull them out in different places. And so, you know, I think, again, it, it, it helps solve the use cases that we set out to solve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I wanted to thank everybody on this call. Um, thank you very much for participating and asking great questions. You know, challenge us. This, this initiative is not myself and Marianne. This initiative is everyone. 
um, and the people who are doing most of the work are the journal's editor-in-chief, as well as their staff. Those are the guys who are on the on the ground doing this work. So, um, you know, please don't think that we're getting all the credit. We're not. It's it's um, it's something that we started, but it's something that has to grow organically, and the people who do the work have to get the credit. And um, most of them, many of them, are on the uh, on the paper that just was um, version two was published. I, I uh, provided a link to that. Um, that was published this morning, and so it's great that they're getting some of this recognition. Certainly, they're the ones that are on the ground, and um, so we want to shout out to all of them. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And please Hi. don't hesitate to contact us if you have any other questions. All the data are open. If you go to the Force 11 webpage, you can get to the database and look at it yourself. Okay. All right. So I'd like to thank Dr. Matron and Dr. Bandrovsky for this great presentation today. The slides and the recording for this webinar will be uploaded on the BioCaddy website at biocaddy.org later on. And our next meeting take place, takes place on December the 10th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And again, Dr. Marianne Marton will be talking about hypothesis. Thank you, everybody, for attending this meeting. Okay. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Turkey Day.